don't think I ever talked about this to anyone, as it is the most terrifying incident of my life. I was in middle school when my dad died in an accident. My mom and I shifted to a new town. She took a job at the local school, and I got admitted there too. So the new boy and the son of a teacher. You can probably imagine how my first day went. A big tall guy, who was the bully, pushed me and I tripped over the dumpster. Someone's leftover smelly hot dog smacked me on the face. The mustard that came out of it looked like poop on my face. Anyways, I got home. I didn't say anything to my mom and went to bed. The next few days went by and I was still the lonely, unwanted kid in school. One day at recess, I was walking to the school cafeteria when I heard a familiar laugh. I followed it and stopped outside of a classroom. My mom was standing near a desk and talking to a man wearing a bow tie. Who the frack wears a bow tie? Yeah, well, we're just adjusting well. I think it's a little tough for Liam. Why? Is he all right? I don't know. He, he doesn't talk much. Well, I can talk to him if you want. And that's how Gerald came into our life. After three months of this conversation, Mom got married to him. He was the school accountant, and they both kind of fell in love and had their perfect marriage. Gerald was not a bad guy. I mean, at first, I just couldn't hate him. After they got married, Gerald moved into our house. He tried hard to impress me. He would make breakfast, take us out to dinner every Friday night, even bought me my favorite gaming console on my birthday. One day, I was taking books from my locker to attend the next class when I felt a strong slap at the back of my head. Turning back, I saw Monte standing behind me with his evil sidekicks. Look who's famous now. Monty, dude, I don't want any trouble. I leave me alone. Or what? Your stepdad's gonna kick my ass? Let me go. You do know that your mom is screwing the school accountant, right? Everyone laughed as he made jokes about my family. I got really angry and shouted, Keep my family out of this, okay? Whoa! Big talks all of a sudden. Saying this, he punched me in the face and gave me a black eye. I lied to my mom, saying I got elbowed in basketball practice. I planned to avoid Monty like a plague from the next day, but fate has something shocking planned. Upon reaching school, we were all informed about the untimely demise of Monty Clement. He was returning home from school and got brutally murdered by some psycho. His body was found floating at the big lake in the woods. His hands and legs were tied and he was thrown into the lake. Not being able to swim, he drowned. As if the death wasn't painful enough, the killer pulled his nails and teeth out. His parents were devastated, and everyone was shocked. Cops started investigating this gruesome murder, and a night curfew took place in the town. No kid was supposed to wander alone in the streets after school. I was sitting on my room in a rainy Sunday afternoon when Gerald came in. Hey, uh, are you all right? I guess so. He sat beside me on the bed and said, were you and Monty close? Um, not exactly. I see. We used to have complaints about him being a bully at school. Did he ever hurt you? I didn't want to say anything about to somebody who just died, so I lied. No, uh, never. I see. Did the cops find who did this? Not yet. Gerald got up and started walking to the door. He suddenly stopped and turned around. His eyes were glowing wide. A sick smile appeared on his face. You're safe now, Liam. And then left. 
A cold shiver ran down my spine. Why did he say that? From the next day on, I started keeping a close eye on Gerald. He had a habit of working in the basement till midnight. After having dinner that night, I remained awake in my bed, waiting for Gerald to go to sleep. As soon as the clock struck midnight, I heard the basement door close. Footsteps started to come upstairs and then stopped right outside my door. It was open and my room was quite dark. The dim light coming from the hallway created a shadowy atmosphere. I looked at the open door and saw Gerald standing outside. His eyes were scanning my room. He didn't notice that I was awake and thank God for that. After watching me sleep for almost a minute straight, he slowly turned around and went to his bedroom. The moment I heard the bedroom door close, I slowly got up from my bed, carefully walked downstairs without making a single noise. The house was pin drop silent and only the sound of the grandfather clock was echoing in the void. I twisted the basement door. He never locked this door. This much I knew. Coming down, I turned on the light and found myself standing in a not so mysterious place. There was a wooden table and a chair. Piles of files and documents were on the desk. A worn out couch and a small television were also in the basement. Nothing suspicious or alarming here, I thought to myself. Suddenly, my eyes went to the small mini freezer where Gerald stored his beers. I don't know why I opened it, but as I did, the ground beneath my feet swept away. Along with the beer cans, there was a jar filled with pungent smelling colorless liquid. And in that solution, handfuls of teeth and fingernails were floating. The ripped out nails still had fleshy residue stuck to them. Why are you up so late, Liam? I turned back in fear and saw Gerald standing behind me. His face had a blank expression and his eyes weren't blinking. He asked me again, Why are you up so late, Liam? I could feel my heart beat getting faster. I started to fumble. Y you, you killed Monty? <laughs> Why? Why did you... Because he hurt you. I'm your dad, and it's my job to protect you. I screamed. Mom! Stop it. Liam, stop shouting. You'll wake the neighbors. You, you're a murderer. Gerald pressed his hand on my mouth and then kissed me on the forehead. His saliva dripped over my nose and then looked me in the eye and whispered, Daddy's going to take care of you. Just let him, Liam. I couldn't make a sound. My voice died in my throat. I only cried. Just then, I heard my mom's voice calling out. Gerald? Liam? What are you guys doing down there? Um, nothing, honey. Just having a chat. He let go of me, and I wiped my face with my sleeve. My mom came down and looked at us. Did you scare him, Gerald? No, no, honey. I was just explaining to Liam about the teeth and nails. Oh my god, Liam. Are you okay? I looked down and saw that I had peed my pants in fear. My mom came close to me and kissed my cheek saying, you don't need to be afraid of him. He just wants to help out. What? Help out with what? I saw Monty bullying you at school. He had it coming, trust me. It felt so good when we tied him up near the lake and pulled his teeth and nails out. We threw his body into the water and watched him drown in the lake. I'm not going to let anyone hurt you. <laughs> I guess that makes us a twisted family, but who cares? I still live with my parents. Me, my mom, and my dad 
Gerald. We had pledged to protect each other for the rest of our lives. I know that they are twisted, but I can't leave them. They are all I have. And for Gerald, I've already lost a father who once cared. I can't lose him now. The remains of Monty are still in our basement freezer. Mom and Dad kept it as a memento. And to think, I also started to grow fond of their weirdness. After all, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. When it all started, I actually liked my stepdad, Ryan. He and my mom met at some work event, and I could tell right away that he was good for her. Mom hadn't really laughed or smiled much in the 18 months after Dad passed away. Ryan gave something back to her, some spark or light or presence. He made her happy, and that made me happy, so I was willing to overlook the weirdness when it first began. Ryan was a giant, at least six foot six or more. I was always surprised his shoulders could even fit through the doorway. He had a dark beard and a booming laugh that he fired off often. But something felt strange from our first meeting. It was his eyes. I decided later. They were small for his face, nearly black. And over the course of the dinner that mom made for the three of us, I don't remember seeing Ryan blink once. The first six months after my stepdad moved in with us were pretty great. He and my mom had a date at least once a week. Ryan even made time to hang out with me, which I respected. Not every new relationship is going to leave time for somebody to try to teach you how to drive or help you with calculus homework, but the guy made an effort. I was stressed enough getting ready to go into my senior year of high school. Knowing that my mom had somebody who made her happy after dad died was a relief in a lot of ways. I noticed early on, though, that certain oddities seemed to hover around my stepfather. Strangers watched him from time to time. Anytime I was out in public with him, I saw people looking at us. I could tell it was more than a casual reaction to Ryan's size. It felt familiar, protective, Eyes followed us in restaurants and parks and stores. My mom seemed oblivious, but that's love for you, I guess. She and Ryan were dreamy-eyed for each other, and sometimes I felt like a third teenage wheel. But honestly, the first couple of months were good for all of us. Then Ryan moved in, and things got weird. My stepdad got a lot of letters and packages. He would wake up before the rest of us and go wait at the mailbox some mornings, but I still saw just how much correspondence came in. No matter the weather, even in the rain, Ryan would be waiting for the mailman. I tried once or twice to intercept the letters, but I never made it to the mailbox on time. Once Ryan had the boxes or envelopes, they disappeared to a shed that he custom built on our property. It stayed locked at all times, and he told my mom and me very clearly that it was his private space. In addition to all the mail, Ryan got a ton of calls at all hours. I'd step out of my bedroom in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and hear him whispering downstairs, having a conversation in the kitchen. Occasionally, I'd creep down the hallway, hoping to catch a few words but my stepfather seemed to have an almost supernatural sense about eavesdropping. Once, I made it most of the way down the staircase before his voice suddenly stopped mid-sentence. I attempted to tiptoe back into my room, but when I reached the top of the stairs, I looked back to see Ryan staring up at me. His face was completely blank in the dim light, which was somehow worse than if he had been angry. I stopped trying to listen in on his late night calls after that. If it was just the letters and the phone calls, I could have let a sleeping dog lie. Even a year in, my mom was still over the moon, head over heels, madly in love with this strange giant man. But then, the long disappearances began. Ryan told us that these were business trips, though he was always cagey about 
exactly what he did for a living? Something about property management, he told us. The man did well, financially. There was no doubt there. Within that first year, he was paying all of the household bills, taking my mom on fancy vacations, and even putting some money aside for my college fund. Ryan never went into details about his job, and his trips started lasting longer and longer. First, it was a few days here and there, then weeks, escalating until he disappeared for nearly a month at the start of my senior year of high school. My mom nailed a smile to her face, but I could tell she was devastated and afraid. I decided to confront Ryan when he finally returned late one night. Mom was already asleep and didn't wake up when he pulled into the garage. I waited half an hour for him to get settled, then walked downstairs. Ryan was sitting at the kitchen table eating leftovers when I sat down. Hey kiddo, he said smiling. The smile dissolved when I asked him where he'd been and then told him I didn't think it was right that he was treating my mom that way, keeping her in the dark. Go to bed, Ryan said, his face cold and flat again. It felt like the temperature in the room dropped. To my shame, I scurried away unable to keep eye contact with those dark, dead eyes of his. But a resolution formed in my mind that night, a promise to myself. I'd at least check the shed to see what my stepdad was storing. I ordered a lock picking kit. Can you believe you can just buy that from Amazon? Then I waited an agonizing week for Ryan and my mom to head out for the day. There were three padlocks on the door. I got through them all in under two minutes. It was a big shed, but cramped. I pushed the door open and saw only shadows from the sunlight behind me. I fumbled around on the wall for a light switch, not even sure if the shed was wired for electricity. Apparently, it was. I flipped the switch and took a step back. The shed was packed with bones. There were boxes full of ribs and femurs, and collarbones, spines dangled from the rafters, and a full human skeleton was stapled to the back wall. I saw knives, big blades that curved back and forth like a snake's tail. A pair of black robes hung on a mannequin in the corner. I was so stunned by the contents of the shed, I barely registered the blinking red light over the door until I thought about it later. It was an alarm system. I was sitting at the kitchen table trying to decide my next move when Ryan's car pulled into the garage. The obvious thing to do was to call the police, but I was terrified that my mom somehow might get in trouble as well. I relocked the shed and figured I had time to talk to her, to warn her about Ryan. Then we could choose what to do together. We'd been safe with him for more than a year or so. What was another day? By the time Ryan pulled his car into the garage though, my mom was already dead. I went out into the garage to meet them and saw her dead, wide-eyed corpse sitting in the passenger seat. Ryan was watching me with a blank face, his shirt stained with my mom's blood, a curvy knife in his hand. I realized he knew I broke into the shed. I wanted to scream, weep for my mom. But when he opened the car door, my legs took over and ran into the house. Ryan had its secrets, and so did I. So did my mom. I knew that she had a small gun stashed away deep in the back of her closet. She bought it after dad died and before she met Ryan. I heard him crashing through the house behind me calling my name. I made it to the gun just as he ran through the bedroom door. I fired until the clip was empty and Ryan was sliding down the hallway wall, six bullets in his stomach and chest. The police arrived quickly. After searching the shed, I found out the truth. Ryan wasn't just a killer. He had a hidden life, several lives actually, several families. Some knew his secrets. Others, like mom, were meant for sacrifice. Ryan had his own little cult 
complete with followers. They were the ones calling him late at night and sending him those packages full of bones. Trophies for his collection. My friend Muriel and I used to go dumpster diving when we were about 12 years old. We lived in the countryside and loved roaming around the town riding our bikes. There was this old abandoned factory in our town in front of which people used to dump their garbage for the cleaning van to take away every Sunday. So, the best time to dumpster dive was Saturday night, as we could have a lot of stuff to look through for hidden treasures. The reason we called our findings hidden treasures is because sometimes we did find some pretty expensive stuff that people just threw away due to a little dysfunction. One time, Muriel found this set of silver forks, which were covered in rust and broken at the tip. We earned good money selling them in a pawn shop. So, it was a Saturday night fun activity that not only gave adventure, but also thrills. The dumpster was located in a sketchy place where no one would go after sundown. The abandoned factory was infamous around the town for all kinds of criminal activities. But we never went inside the factory, just kept our business to the dumpsters. Until one night, our world turned upside down. I was standing on the sidewalks opposite Muriel's house and waiting for him to sneak out so we could go on our routine expedition. After five minutes, he came out and we began riding to our destination. It was a full moon night, so even if our cycles had headlights, the view was still clear as crystal. The silver moonlight helped us navigate our way. We passed the cornfields, then the shimmering lake, and finally reached the abandoned factory. We parked our bikes under a big tree and walked to the dumpster grabbing our flashlight and pickup sticks. The dumpster had a reeking smell, so we didn't want to use our hands directly to grab something. Like I said, we have done this many times, but particularly that night, something felt off about that entire place. Generally, we would hear sounds of crickets and frogs, but that night, we heard nothing. Isn't it too quiet tonight? Yeah. I said, while scanning the spooky surroundings. Suddenly, a coyote howled in the woods and Muriel said, Um, let's get this done with and go home. I'm getting a weird vibe about this place tonight. Muriel was braver than me in most cases, but as soon as he said that, I felt the hair at the back of my neck stand up. We poked and ransacked the dumpster with our sticks. After a pile of household waste and rotten food, I saw a red hairy thing peeking out under a black layer of a garbage bag. Hey, Muriel, what do you think that is? I don't know. We looked at each other and I moved the layer of plastic to see it more clearly. As soon as I did that, I backed away screaming in fear. Ah! Holy moly, is that... Is that... The reason Muriel stuttered in fear was in front of our eyes. A partial head with curled red hair was now peeking from the pile in that dumpster. We were about to pee ourselves as we realized we might have discovered the body of a woman. Should we call the police? But who would believe us that we had nothing to do with this murder? While Muriel and I went on discussing what should be done in this situation, my eyes went back to my head, and I saw it move. I froze in fear. No words came out of my mind. I just kept staring at that head in the dumpster. Russell? Russell? What is it? Muriel called out to me and I pointed at the head with my shaking hands. Both of our eyes got fixated on the head and we were pinned to the ground by an unknown fear. The head moved in a very creepy way, bobbled up and down a little for a few seconds. And then all of a sudden... <laughs> a woman rose from the dumpster. She looked like a being from another world. Her red stringy hair floated in the air like a pile of snakes. Her long pointy nose with a huge black blitz on its top dangled on her face. And her eyes... I've never seen such wide, scary eyes. Her eyes almost stretched to the cheekbones, making her stare cold as a dead fish. She slowly crawled out of that pile of the dumpster like a four-legged animal, and we slowly took our steps back in fear. <laughs> 
I didn't know you boys would come to visit me. She looked like a woman, but her voice was of a possessed demon. Our bikes were still far from our reach, and I knew if we tried to run, she had a very good chance to catch one of us and do unthinkable things. So I tried to play it cool. We, we, were, we were only fooling around. Were you? Yeah, yeah. In fact, we were just about to leave. You know, our parents must be worried, so... <laughs> I don't think your parents know you are here. <laughs> um, look, we're sorry to disturb you, dumpster lady. It won't happen again, okay? <sighs> dumpster lady, that's not bad. But what won't happen again? This, I mean, we'll, we'll never come back here. We promise. Yeah, we promise. Who said you'd be able to leave and come back again? <laughs> Saying this, she jumped on Muriel and started choking him. Her filthy long nails dug into Muriel's flesh and he screamed for his life. I, on the other hand, was so taken aback by fear that for a few seconds I didn't know what to do and then an idea came to my mind. I ran close to her and poked her in the eye with my picking up tool. This made her move away while holding her one eye, writhing in pain, and I picked up Muriel from the ground. We both started running to the tree and turning back to see the lady chasing us like a mad dog. She was literally running like a four-legged animal. Stop, you little pigs! I'll catch you and break your necks like twigs! Stop! Obviously, we didn't stop. As soon as we got to our bikes, we bolted out of there. The lady chased us till the factory went out of our sight, and then we never saw her again. We didn't stop until we reached Muriel's house. I went home shaking like a coward and didn't utter a single word to my parents. Muriel and I both knew that we would be the ones to get in trouble for sneaking out and risking our lives, so we remained quiet about this lady. But the story doesn't end here. The next day, Muriel came for a sleepover at my place. We were just watching TV before dinner when my dad turned to the news channel. The county sheriff is said to have found the body of an 11-year-old boy in the dumpster near the abandoned factory this afternoon. As per the autopsy report, the boy died due to choking. The police officers also found a strand of red curly hair stuck in his hand. The sheriff is suspecting that the killer is a woman with red curly hair. The victim's family claimed that the boy left home on his bike this morning and never came home. His bike is also missing. No suspect has been identified yet. Muriel and I exchanged a fearful look. We told our parents about this woman right away and they took us to the police station immediately. Both Muriel and I gave them information about the appearance of the woman and they distributed her sketches so that people could identify her if she was seen in the area, but she never was. The boy's bike was found in the cornfield two days later, but there was no sign of that woman. The fact that if Muriel and I didn't get the chance to escape that night, one of us, or maybe both of us, might have been dead already. Most people often have a bad impression about dumpster diving, but in reality, one can find many precious, completely unused items which had just been thrown away. Some of you might not know that there are dedicated dumpster divers who don't do this because of the financial crisis. It's more like a treasure hunt experience for them. I used to be one of them. Now, you're probably wondering, why did I stop? That's where this one incident comes in that shook me for life. It was a Wednesday. I was surfing through Netflix not finding anything interesting enough to watch, so I decided to take a stroll through the neighborhood. I lived in this small house with my dog, Duty. On my way out, I kissed him and said, You're up for watch, Duty boy. See you later. He wagged his tail and I grabbed my backpack and left. The plan was to roam around the neighborhood dumpster trying my luck. 
I had already found an iPhone and two silver candle stands which I sold at a pawn shop in exchange for a good price. Hence, I was pretty confident and excited to see what I could find that night. I rode on my bike and started searching for a favorable spot. After wandering for 15 minutes with no luck, I finally discovered this huge dumpster located at the railroad. It used to be an attractive railway track, but since the nearby station burnt down in a terrible fire, this place had become abandoned. I'm not an easy scare, so standing near an abandoned railway track right next to the woods in the middle of the night didn't raise my heartbeat at all. Like I said, it wasn't my first time diving into a dumpster, so I was cool with the situation. I parked my bike under a tree and walked to the dumpster. I always carried rubber gloves because obviously trash is trash at the end of the day. Many times I found used syringes and contaminated belongings which I didn't want to touch with my bare hands so I put on gloves and my torch helmet to begin the expedition. The sound of frogs and crickets accompanied by howling coyotes kept reminding me how the night was getting younger. The dumpster was filled with leftover food which was rotting already. The foul smell irked me, but I still kept going. I found a large trash bag and tore it to see the contents inside. There were mostly household waste along with baby diapers, empty cereal boxes, ragged clothes, and a Teletubby soft toy about two feet in length. I couldn't identify what color it was due to the muddy stains covering it. I kept the toy aside, thinking that it would be a good gift for duty. I continued searching for 10 minutes more and concluded that this wasn't my lucky night. Taking the soft toy, I decided to head home. I was riding my bike while staring at this Teletubby doll I had just found. There was nothing suspicious about this toy except it felt a little heavy. I reached home at around 1.30 a.m. Duty started barking as soon as he saw me. I entered the house to be showered with an enormous amount of licking and cuddling from him. This, of course, was his way to say that he was glad I was home. I caressed his furry back and said, Hey, boy, look what I found. Your luck proved to be better than mine tonight. Saying this, I showed Duty the toy, but didn't get the reaction I was hoping for. As soon as he saw the toy, he moved back whimpering like he wasn't happy at all to see it. What's wrong, boy? Don't you like it? He made that squeaky cry as if he was trying to tell me to get rid of this piece of junk. I guessed it was probably the dust and trashy smell making him disinterested, so I threw it into the washing machine. Slowly, the mud started to come off, and when I took it out, I realized that it was a doll of Lala, the big yellow Teletubby. I was going to put it in the dryer when I flipped the toy and my heart stopped. On the back of that toy, I could spot a few lines written with a marker. It read, In remembrance of baby Kyle, May you find peace in heaven. Jesus, did I just pick up a doll that once belonged to a dead kid? That's when I heard Duty let out a spine-chilling howl and the power of my house shut down. I stood in the darkness holding the toy. For the first time, it felt like something was not right with it. The eyes of Lala glowed in the dark as if they were alive. Suddenly, my doorbell rang and I almost got a heart attack. Bloody hell. Duty came running to me and whimpered like he was scared. Who could it be at this hour? I slowly walked to the door and looked through the eye hole. What I saw made my skin crawl. A scary looking man with a huge grin on his face was standing on my porch. He had an upside down cross engraved on his forehead with a sharp object. Blood was still dripping from his forehead flowing down his nose. A strain of blood flowed down to his lips and he licked his blood and said in a raspy, spine-chilling voice, I think you have something that doesn't belong to you. <laughs> what? Uh, who are you? I've come to take the doll you picked up from the railroad dumpster. How do you know it's me? Baby Kyle told me. What? Baby Kyle wants to go home. He doesn't belong with you, so give him back now. I couldn't make out what shocked me the most at that moment. A freaky looking man who probably worships the devil has come to my doorstep or I just picked up a doll that belonged to a dead kid once. 
For the first time in my life, I was scared for bringing home something from a dumpster that wasn't mine. I said in a confused voice, Did you follow me? I do not have time to chit chat with you, you poor mortal! Just hand me the doll and I'll be on my way! Why do you need this doll so desperately? Enough with your rubbish! Give me my doll back! Do it! Do it now! Saying this, the man started to bang his head on my door like a freaking psycho. He was banging his head so hard that at one point I thought his brains would come out. Leave my house or I'm calling the cops, you freak! I immediately dialed 911 and the man suddenly stopped the sick stunt he was pulling off. He then took out his tongue and believe me, I will never forget that scene. He had a black tongue and suddenly, Two other men came out from the sides who were hiding all this time. I realized they all came up with a plan that the moment I will open the door, they'll lunge at me. Luckily, I didn't. When the cops came, the three men were gone. I told them everything and gave them a thorough description of those men. So far, they haven't been spotted, and I burnt the doll in my basement incinerator. I have no clue about why those men came to my house to get back a worn out Teletubby doll that once belonged to a dead kid, but I am pretty sure that they were in a cult and used black magic and stuff like that. God knows what their intentions were, but I sleep with a knife under my pillow to date. The only reason I became an Uber driver is the flexible work hours, which could go perfectly with my college schedule. My family was totally out of the picture when it came to my financial stability. My mom was a drug addict and I never met my dad. So working for Uber helped me stand on my own feet. I didn't have any plans for last weekend, so I decided to make good money. I started driving at around 10 p.m. and planned on finishing up at around 2. Since most rides were going between buildings on campus, I knew I'd be able to get a lot of drives within those four hours. Everything went smoothly in the first few rides. I had to drive drunk college kids to their dorms. At about 1.30, I got a notification that someone had requested a ride. Looking closer, I noticed where the ride was heading. It was some random address a few towns over, much farther than I'd gone with any of my other drives that night. At the moment, this made it more appealing to accept, since the longer the ride, the more I get paid. It didn't seem like a sketchy area or anything like that, so I accepted the request. It only took me four to five minutes to get to the address where I was supposed to pick up the last passenger of the night. The man didn't have a profile picture, but his name was Rudy. It also seemed like he didn't have any rider ratings, meaning his account was either brand new or he just never used it. I made a right turn onto the street where the address was located, and as I turned around, I started to think that maybe someone pranked me. The street was completely spooky. All the houses seemed abandoned or under construction. Graffiti, broken windows, boarded up front doors. I couldn't imagine anyone possibly living there, let alone having a party there. Suddenly, I noticed a man standing at some distance. He was looking the opposite way, which felt strange. Even stranger, he started waving. Not waving at me. My car wasn't even close enough for him to be doing that. He was out on the lawn, facing across the street, just waving at nothing. I thought once I approached the final destination, I would see some newer, fancier house built on the street that I'd never seen before. I was very wrong. The house that I approached, which was behind the lawn my passenger was standing on, looked almost more broken down than the rest. I stopped the car right in front of the lawn, which is when I finally got a chance to focus on the man's frame for a brief moment. He was of average height, dressed in a black jacket and brown joggers. He was still waving, but now seeing the car headlights, he stopped and turned around. My car lights illuminated his face pretty well and that's when I almost peed my pants. The man had a horrible face. He had a stitched up grin spreading ear to ear. 
someone perform surgery on his face, making a Mr. Smiley face forever. I wanted to drive off canceling the ride, but as soon as our eyes met, I couldn't help but stop the car. He opened the passenger side door and sat next to me. For some reason, this sent a shiver up my spine. After directing my phone to start the navigation, I decided to start a conversation. So, you live here, huh? Not anymore. His voice sounded weird as he talked, retaining that grinning face. Oh, I see. He kept staring at me with that disturbing face and I could feel my blood freezing. I wanted to ask him what was wrong with his face, but I didn't want to do anything to piss him off. I kept on driving silently when he asked me in that same disturbing voice. Do you mind if I eat? Normally, I would say no, but again, I didn't want to make this guy mad. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Thanks. He took out a bundle of aluminum foil and started to unwrap his food. I couldn't see what exactly he was eating, but he was making a lot of sounds while doing so. His food was squishy and soggy. With every bite, I could hear a loud chomp that made me nauseous. Also, a foul smell of his food choked the air inside the car. Would you mind if I rolled down the windows? No. Go ahead. After a disturbing moment of hearing this creepy man eat, I watched him finally finish the food. He threw the wrapper away and turned his head towards me. Now, his face changed into a way scarier look. I guessed whatever he ate had too much ketchup in it, and now the red ketchup was smeared all over his toothy grin. His mouth, teeth, and hands were covered in that red, thick liquid. The man said, Do you have water? Um, sure. There's a bottle under your seat. I was freaking out at this point, but somehow I managed to be calm. His destination was 15 minutes away and I was praying to God for this night to end quickly. The man grabbed the bottle, drank some water, and then suddenly asked a question that almost stopped my heart. Are you scared of me? Wh what Does my face scare you? Um, no. What is there to be scared about, sir? I'm just here to do my job. I answered, without end of sobbing, I fear. The man moved the rearview mirror towards him, looked his face in it, and said, When I was a little kid, I had difficulty smiling. My mom got so angry at me as I always ruined every family photo, being the grumpy face. I remember how kids in school bullied me for being a creep. Once I turned 16, I left my house to search for something that will make me smile. And did you find it? No, but that didn't stop me from smiling. Because I did find someone who finally put a smile on my face, which will stay like this forever. Is that the friend you were waving at when I came to pick you up? <laughs> you are not just a good driver, but also a clever boy. Yes. I came here to show my friend the perfect family picture, where I could finally smile. Oh, what, what did your friend say? He was proud of his work. In fact, you've been so nice to me. Do you want to see the picture too? I would love to show you. <laughs> Not knowing what to say, I remained silent. The man slowly took out his phone from his jacket pocket and showed me his perfect family photo. I will never forget what I saw. It was a selfie taken inside a house. An old woman was lying dead on the couch. Her mouth was wide open like she died in terrible shock, and this man was crouched down to her level, looking at the camera flaunting his big grin. I took this with my mother today. I am so happy that my smiling face was the last thing she saw before leaving this world. <laughs> my friend did a good job, didn't he? 
Now I can smile all the time. <laughs> all the freaking time. <laughs> Everyone will call me the smiling man. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't talk anymore. I just felt my body shutting down in fear. My vision got blurry, and I passed out while driving the car. I woke up two hours later in the hospital. A truck driver found my car crashed into a tree on the side of the road. Luckily, I had no injury, which seemed surprising to the cops as well as the doctors. None of them found a man that matched my description. When I think about that night, I get a lot of doubts that it was real. Did I really pick up Rudy, the smiling man? I was returning home from a horrible Tinder date. The guy was boring as hell, and I drank too much to sit through the date. I booked myself an Uber and was waiting at the stranded street for it to arrive. After a long search, my app dinged with the name Bill. The car arrived within three minutes. I jumped in the back, buckled up, and we set off to my destination. Four water bottles were placed in a cooler pack in the middle seat along with a tray of snacks. I loved when drivers did this. I was going to give him five stars, especially after a night of drinking. Those water bottles were a godsend. I dug through the pile of snacks and plopped a blue Jolly Rancher in my mouth. Hey Bill, you got any good tunes? He didn't respond. Surely he heard me, or maybe I was drunk and slurring. I piped up again, this time louder, and after clearing my throat. Um, Bill, excuse me. He looked at me through the rearview mirror. Oh, yeah, yeah. He proceeded to turn on the radio. A country song that's overplayed squeaked through the speakers. But Bill was acting fidgety, so I figured I'd just ride this out. It wouldn't be much longer till I was home. After a few minutes of awkward silence, Bill finally began to speak up. You've been drinking tonight. I twiddled my thumbs and looked out the side window. I was so tired and just wanted to curl up in my bed. I replied, yeah, just a few drinks. His creepy eyes stared at me through the rearview mirror. A sick smile appeared on his face. I could tell that he was trying to catch a glimpse of me without me noticing. He spoke up again. This time, a grin spread across his face. What did you all drink tonight? I had a tequila sunrise, uh, old fashioned, and a few glasses of champagne. He sat up in his seat, one arm still on the wheel. Those deep brown eyes kept flickering at me in the rearview mirror. Almost every couple of seconds, he started to pry. You drink tequila often? No, sometimes. D depends on my mood. <laughs> you drunk tonight? Now, it started to make me feel uncomfortable. I didn't want to drive home myself, so one could assume that I was, at best, tipsy. Why was he asking me questions of my level of coherence? I kept my eyes focused out the window because I was getting creeped out by the accidental eye contact. Oh, no, I'm just a little buzzed. You want to be drunk, though? I have a bottle of tequila back there. I stared down at my phone. Just three more minutes till I was home. Um, no thanks, I'm good. He had both hands on the steering wheel now. He was gripping it tightly and rubbing his hands against the leather. This nervous feeling rose in my gut and I know that they say never to ignore your gut feelings. But I was already in the car with this guy. I was a few minutes from my house. What was I supposed to do? I sat there, 
and kept my eyes glued to the window. Perhaps if I didn't show any interesting conversations with him, he would just get me home without suggesting anything inappropriate. So, you're done partying for the night, huh? Responsible. I let out a short chuckle and agreed with him. <laughs> yeah, I'm done for the night. Well, help yourself to the water. I have plenty. My heart started to slow, and I realized that he was just trying to earn that five-star review by being accommodating. Maybe he was just trying to be nice. I grabbed the water bottle and twisted the lid off and took a couple gulps. I saw the turn from my street up ahead and a rush of relief washed over me. That is, until he passed it. That's right, he completely passed my street. I sat up in my seat, screwed the lid back on the water bottle and spoke up. Uh, no, that was my street that you just passed. Silence. Again, I spoke up loud of his time. You passed my street. What he said in return made my heart jump into my throat. I know. I need you to turn back. My house is back. Shut up. I sank back in my seat as panic set in. My voice was shaking, and I'll admit, I was beginning to freak out. What's going on? What are you doing? He didn't answer. He kept driving faster as sweat broke down the nape of his neck. Again, I tried to muster up the strength to grab my phone from under the seat when I heard loud sirens of cop cars following us. I tried to keep my eyes open and my body's balanced. Where was he taking me? Why are the cops following him? I didn't need to ponder his actions for too long because I saw what he was speeding from. Red and blue flashing lights. Stop the car! Just sit there, you witch. I'm not getting arrested tonight. What? Who are you? Why are the cops following you? You talk too much. Saying this, he suddenly turned around and punched me so hard that my vision started to blur. That's when I saw another cop car coming from the opposite side of the road, blocking the Uber. The car came too close and a loud gunshot took place. Bill pressed the brakes too hard. And with the sound of tires screeching, I fainted in the back seat. When I came to my senses, I found myself lying on the hospital bed. Two cops came in to talk to me, and what I found out from them scarred me for life. The shocking part was that my Uber driver wasn't an Uber driver at all. Bill, the poor Uber driver, was murdered long before I was picked up. The guy that had been driving me was a man named Trevor, who had murdered Bill after robbing him on the highway. Bill had been dead for 18 hours, leaving Trevor a trail of three different girls to be picked up under the guise of Bill. All three girls were brutally murdered at the hands of Trevor. By the time he had picked me up, the authorities had caught on. They were able to trace the GPS attached to Bill's Uber app, which is how they were able to trap Trevor the way they did. I don't know what or who tipped off the authorities, but I'm so thankful that the game of cat and mouse ended with me safe and sound. I feel horrible for those girls that didn't make it, and I can't even comprehend how scared they must have felt. The true weight of the situation was revealed when I turned on the news the next morning. The headline story talked about the three girls who were murdered but the description of how they were found is what made my stomach heave in disgust. All three girls had refiling in their system. They found that there was a high quantity of the drug in a tequila bottle found in the car. Also, 
Six bottles of water found in the back seat, each had high levels of the drug. That's right, the water bottle that I drank from. That explains why I became so out of it. Again, I thought I was being responsible. Little did I know. Each girl had their ears, nose, and lips cut off. Based on blood analysis, the girls were alive during this. It still haunts me to think about what would have happened to me if the authorities hadn't found me. I'd be mutilated in a ditch right now. As they said, I dodged a bullet, all in the name of responsibility. For now, I'm just thanking my lucky stars that several good people saved my life from one bad person. It had been a week since I started working at the Circle K a few blocks from my house. I just graduated from high school, and instead of spending my summer free of responsibilities, I chose to get a job to start saving for my first college semester. Most of my shifts were taken, so I considered myself fortunate to snag the graveyard shift. I lived in a smaller town, so it wasn't unusual to see a lack of customers. I didn't exactly enjoy being up all night, but at least it was peaceful. I spent the majority of my time with my creepy co-worker, Jim. He was a short, older man with a bald spot on his head that reminded me of George Costanza. He was pale and plump. His gut was round and indicated he'd pounded one too many beers on his days off. His eyes were beady and sunken in. They hid behind thick glasses, yet still managed to give me the chills when his gaze would meet mine. I'd catch him staring at me sometimes, until I felt so uncomfortable that I'd have to turn away. I assumed he was a loner. He didn't interact with me or anyone who came into the store. The only thing that would bring him to life was when we'd get the occasional unruly loiterer outside. His solemn mood would shift to anger. He'd shout, ball his fists, and make threats that would scare them off. As crazy as it seemed, it was effective. I felt safe. One night, as I bounced into the store, feeling energized and ready for my shift, he was standing behind the register, his face red and sweaty. He wiped his forehead with the back of his wrist and looked up at me. Claire, he grumbled. Hi, Jim. You okay? I'm fine. Listen, stay out of the restroom. Something's wrong with the plumbing. I called the manager. They'll have someone come fix it in the morning. If you need to go, go across the street to the diner and use theirs. They're open all night. He furrowed his brow and pushed the bridge of his glasses up with a pudgy index finger, then huffed. Um, okay. Thanks for the heads up. I gave him a confused look before clocking in. I didn't exactly like the idea of going out of my way just to pee, but our store was small and only had one unisex restroom, so I didn't have a choice. Jim didn't seem like himself at all. He'd never spoken so many words to me in one night, and he looked exhausted. Perhaps he and the plunger had duked it out in the restroom and he lost the battle. I chuckled at the thought as I began my shift. A few hours passed and I was busy restocking items in a corner near the restroom. I was humming one of my favorite songs when a loud thump startled me. What was that? I yelped. Jim rushed over. What was what? He demanded. Another thump was heard and I jumped. That noise! He grabbed my arm and yanked me away. It's the pipes. I told you something's wrong with the plumbing. Don't go in there. I wasn't going to, I stammered. It, it was just... Just the pipes. Jim scowled at me and then turned away to help a customer who'd walked in. A few hours later, he announced that he was heading across the street to the diner and would return shortly. He handed the mop to me and told me to finish what he'd started. I did what I was told. As I moved across the floor, sliding the mop around, it happened again. The thumping. I froze. I was no plumber, but the noise I was hearing sounded nothing like pipes. I set the mop aside and held my breath as I inched closer to the restroom and placed my hand on the knob. I turned it slowly. 
I was going to find out what it was. I let out an exasperated sigh, realizing it was locked. I reached for the mop so I could get back to work, but paused when I heard it again. It was getting louder. The hairs on my arms and back of my neck prickled. My heart raced as I tried to swallow the lump in my throat. I rushed back to the door and pressed my ear against it. The thumping continued. Curiosity had gotten the best of me, so I hurried to get the keys to the restroom, but couldn't find them. I quickly searched for something to pick the lock. I found a paperclip and shook my head, knowing it probably wouldn't work, but I had to try anyway. I grabbed it and ran back to the door. I bent it and poked it in the keyhole, wiggling it around. I stopped and my eyes widened when I heard the entrance door chime. Jim was back. I didn't say a word and listened as he walked in. I looked over my shoulder and saw him standing behind me, staring. I told you not to go in there, Claire. You don't listen. He spoke with a grave tone as he slowly inched closer towards me, his eyes burning into mine. I don't think that's thumping in the pipes, Jim. I need to check it out. Where are the keys? I turned to face him. I tried to sound bold despite the intimidating expression on his face. I have them. Don't worry about it. Get back to work. He pointed towards the register and snapped his fingers. No, I'm going to call the manager. This is crazy. I pulled my cell phone from my back pocket and that's when he lunged at me. I screamed and tried to get past him, but he shoved me. I fell back against the door. His solemn mood quickly switched to one of anger, and I panicked. I remembered how angry he'd get with the loiterers. Stop, Jim, please! You're scaring me! I begged. His face was flushed and his fists were clenched. You girls never listen, do you? His voice was hoarse and his eyes darted from side to side. He was contemplating his next move and I didn't want to be there for it. I rushed to one side and squealed as he tried to shove me again. I managed to get past him and tried to bolt for the door, but his stout body was faster than I'd expected and he wrapped his arm around my waist, stopping me. His breath was hot and heavy on my neck. It looks like I'm gonna have to punish you too! He grunted into my ear and squeezed his arms tight around me. Uh, what the hell are you talking about? Let me go! I reached back and dug my nails into the side of his face. He cried out in pain, letting go long enough for me to push away and try to make a run for it. I looked back and saw him following. His eyes seemed glazed over as he growled like a crazed beast and screamed profanities at me. Blood dripped from his cheek. A few buttons on his work shirt had busted off from the struggle and his repulsive gut was exposed as he heaved himself at me once more. I was almost to the door when my foot slipped on the wet floor. I fell forward and landed hard, my head making a sickening thump as it met the tile. My vision was blurred as I looked back at Jim. He hovered over me and grinned, seeming proud that he'd won. My eyes fluttered and everything went black. When I came to, I was in a hospital room with my mother. She explained that just as I had passed out, two large men entered the store and saw Jim trying to drag me to the restroom. They called the police and were able to keep him detained long enough for the authorities to get there. But what made my heart nearly stop was that she informed me of what they'd found in the restroom. It was a girl, gagged and bound. The thumping I'd heard had been her kicking as she struggled to get my attention that whole night. Jim told the cops that she was trying to shoplift and he locked her in there as a form of punishment and was going to deal with her after his shift ended. The incident still gives me goosebumps to this day. Needless to say, I'm glad we both made it out alive, but I'll never be working at another convenience store again. This happened on my last night at the Circle K outlet, where I had worked for almost three and a half years. It was around 5 a.m. I was arranging the shelves. The assistant manager, Paul, was standing at the counter and watching some videos on YouTube. It was just the two of us that night. 
I wasn't expecting anyone soon, but suddenly, a pleasant looking older woman walked in. She was dressed in all black and had an expressionless face. She poured two cups of coffee and brought them to the front to see Paul. He greeted her, rang her up, and asked, That'll be all, ma'am? She stood there silently for a few seconds and walked back to the shelves. She kept staring at the products, thinking she'd forgotten something. Paul waited patiently for her to return. After a few minutes, the woman came back with a packet of instant ramen noodles. Paul rang her up and again asked, All right, that's all then? She silently walked back and back over to the shelves. She looked at me with a look of slightly panicked confusion. At this point, I realized that this pleasant looking older woman was well dressed in all black, quiet, and was wearing a gold cross. I looked at her and looked at Paul and said in a low voice, I think she's going to a funeral. I looked at the clock and said, All right, I have time for this. It was about 5.35, and I wasn't technically off till 6, so I walked across the store to where she was standing. She turned and looked at me with the strangest, hollowest eyes. I looked at her with as much compassion as I could muster, and I asked, Who was it? She gave me a look like she didn't understand how I knew. She opened her mouth to answer, and started to wail instead. She began crying hysterically, loudly. She threw her arms around me and collapsed on the floor by the coolers, just a crumbled and broken person. I wrapped the woman in my arms. I held her while she cried and I tried my best to comfort her with genuine concerns. She told me it was her husband and there had been an accident, a sudden and violent death, and she blamed herself. After 10 minutes of the most soul-shattering crying you can imagine, I helped her to her feet and I walked her out of the store into the parking lot. I ran back into the store and buy her coffee and went back out to talk with her. She hugged me and continued to cry. I talked to her about the fragility of life and how you can't blame yourself for accidents, no matter how much you believe it's your fault. They're not. I didn't want to leave her in such a terrible state. Finally, after an hour, she seemed like she pulled herself together. She stopped crying, fixed herself up, and looked at me and said, What church do you go to? Well, I don't go to church. Why not? It's not really for me. Well, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Well, why not? Well, I'm, I'm an atheist. The woman's face churned into disgust. You're a monster. I, I'm sorry. He, who has not accepted Jesus, will suffer an eternity in the darkest pits of hell. Being completely shocked by her sudden change of behavior, I moved away from her. She screamed, You touched me! How dare you touch me! With your unclean hands! You who dares make a mockery of the Bible! You who has turned your back against God! How dare you touch me! How dare you touch someone like me! I nervously went back into the store while she screamed more and more obscenities at me. I walked behind the counter and Paul asked, So, uh, how did it go? I was too stunned to answer, but I tried explaining just when the Circle K entrance slammed open and the woman re-entered the store. But this time, she looked nothing like a laminated wife. Her eyes were bloodshot. Her body was shaking in anger. Paul sensed something wasn't right, so he said, Uh, ma'am, are you alright? This place needs cleansing. What? Ma'am, we clean here every day. Paul, it's, that, no, it's not what she meant. What do you mean? I told him how the woman thinks I'm scum here because I don't believe in God. 
Thinking this was just a lightheaded manner, Paul walked close to the woman to make her understand where she was going wrong, and that's where she did the unthinkable. Help me! Help me! These men are taking advantage of me! Oh Lord, save me from these devils! Saying this, she started ripping off her clothes like a lunatic. I quickly realized that she was trying to do. This woman was a nut job. She was trying to frame me and Paul as sexual offenders. Paul screamed. What the hell is wrong with you? Leave, now, or I'm calling the cops. Yes, call them. So I want you to call them so I can show them what you're doing to me. Call them right now. Bloody hell. <laughs> you think you can beat me? I have the Lord at my side, and the cops will too, after seeing how you ripped my clothes off. You two monsters will suffer the wrath of the Almighty's judgment. That's when I decided enough was enough. I looked her in the eye and said in a stern, cold voice, You know we have security cameras all over this place, right? So no matter what you do to yourself to frame us is getting recorded with actual evidence. So even if your Almighty sides with you, the cops won't. Because the law doesn't run on belief, but on evidence and we will have to show it to the cops when they arrive. Paul locked the doors so she can't run away. As soon as I said this, her face turned pale. She looked around the corners trying to spot the security cameras. Once she did, she took a few steps back and stopped making a scene she was making a few moments back. She then ran to the exit, opened the door to leave before we could lock her in. For one last time, she turned towards me and said something that was still give me goosebumps. I'll never let you live in peace. Never. Never. Never! I left my job the next day. People might call me a coward, but I had this feeling that the woman would come back for me. And guess what she did the next morning? She did. With a gun. Luckily, Paul saw her pulling up to the driveway and immediately locked the door so she couldn't get in. He called the cops, but the woman escaped just a moment while she heard the cop sirens approaching. I changed my address long ago. God, I hope I never see that woman again. I was looking at the clock. It was 9.30 already and I still had tons of work to finish before the deadline. I had recently landed this new job, so there's no way I can risk it. The night was quiet and I could see the pale moonlight illuminating the empty streets from my bedroom window, my poor stomach gnarled in hunger, making a serious rumble. Oh, it's time to eat. I grabbed my phone and checked the restaurants nearby. I was craving some pizza, so I dialed the Papa John's shop down the block. A man with a rough voice picked up the call. Papa John! Hi, I would like to order a large cheese pizza with a soft crust and no toppings. No toppings, huh? This is something new. <laughs> yeah, whatever. We're short staffed tonight, so I will deliver your order myself. Fine. I gave them my address and disconnected the call. I poured myself another cup of black coffee and continued to work on my laptop. I live in this small house that once belonged to my grandpa. He gave me this house in his will, so after finishing high school I moved here to work. My neighborhood is generally identified as safe, but that night things went the other way. For the next 15 minutes my eyes were stuck to the laptop screen. I was so devoted to work that when the doorbell rang it startled me. Coming. I took money from my purse and rushed to the main door. Without thinking much, I opened the door and saw a man dressed in a Papa John's uniform standing on my porch. He was overweight with a rusty beard and wide green eyes. Seeing me, a sinister smile appeared on his face. Here's your order, one cheese pizza with no toppings. Thanks. I went to hand him the money and he brushed his hand on my arm intentionally while taking it. A cold shiver ran down my spine as the man touched me. I felt uneasy like something bad was about to happen and I won't be able to stop it. 
I didn't react and turned to go inside, when suddenly the man grabbed me by the wrist and pulled me closer to him. He then got inside while threatening to murder me. Being a puppet of his hands, I closed the door behind us. The man was now inside of my home. He had a knife and I couldn't even scream. He sat down on the couch and blew me a kiss in the air. Now, be a good girl and bring me a beer and a plate. And do not try to be smart with me. Okay, I'll do as you say, but promise me you will leave after robbing me. Robbing you? <laughs> Who said I came here to rob you? Look, you can take all my money. I, I won't even call the cops or complain about you to Papa John's. Trust me. <laughs> Lady, I don't even work at Papa John's. I just murdered their night staff and was leaving with the cash when you called. I thought I'd ignore it, but once I heard your voice on the phone, I recalled how lonely I am. I realized I have to be calm and handle the situation carefully. I have to defend myself wisely. I slowly walked to the kitchen and grabbed a plate and a beer, just like he told me to. He drank the beer in one chug and chomped a big slice of pizza like a ravenous zombie while staring at me in a very creepy way. The cheese melted from the slice along with the red pizza sauce, making his mouth and hands messy. He placed the knife down to wipe his face with his sleeve, and I snatched the knife right away. His expression changed as the table turned. He got up nervously and said, Look, I'll leave, okay? Just don't do anything stupid. But it's my turn to have fun now. <laughs> what? I always order my pizza with no toppings. Do you know why? What the hell are you talking about? I struck him on the hand with the knife, and a chunk of flesh got sliced. Blood came rushing, and he fell to the couch holding his bloody hand. His eyes were filled with fear. I felt bad for scarring him, but this is how I do it generally. Honestly, I did order my favorite topping. Have you ever tried cheese pizza with chunks of human meat on it? <laughs> Oh my god, you're a psycho! The man got up and tried to run to the main door, but I stabbed him in the back. The knife pierced into his lung, or maybe his heart. He fell to the wooden floor with a loud thump. I locked the main door. I was furiously hungry, so first I decided to eat. I cut a huge chunk of meat from his back and then peeled out the skin, cut the meat into little pieces and fried them in butter. I then added my favorite pizza topping to all the other slices left in the box. One by one, I ate them all. Mm. Delicious. I generally don't do this often. I only order takeout whenever I run out of meat. My own kind of meat. I kill two to three people in a month. Usually I go for homeless people whom no one cares to find out about. This guy would have walked out alive if he didn't force himself in my house, so <laughs> I hit the jackpot automatically. Now I will slice his meat into different cuts, segregate the bones and skin from the flesh. I feed the bones to the stray dogs or sometimes just burn them in my backyard with my other garbage. And the skin? Well, I bury that with my victim's belongings, like his clothes, wallet, shoes. It's easy to hunt when you have a pretty face. People take you as a damsel in distress every time. Once I finish this guy, I'll go for a woman, but honestly, to me, men taste so much better. <laughs> I don't know exactly what day my wife Naomi started sleepwalking. It was definitely within this past week, and the first night wasn't horrible. A little odd, sure, but nothing too crazy. I woke up to the sound of cupboards opening and closing. I looked over at my wife's side of the bed and noticed it was empty. I sighed and got out of bed, wiping the sleep from my eyes. 
She was standing near the cupboard and just repeatedly opening and closing the doors. It was like a child slamming the bedroom door again and again. Uh, Naomi, what's going on? I called out as I walked close to her. She was standing stiff as a board, head staring straight down at the ground. Her right hand was reaching above her head with the cupboard handle gripped tightly, opening then closing the door over and over. Naomi, what the heck are you doing? She didn't stop. She stood in the same position, in the same rhythm slamming the door. After staring at her with wide eyes for a few seconds, my brain finally woke up enough to realize she must have been sleepwalking. I'll admit my heart was racing pretty good. It's kind of a creepy sight to wake up out of a dead sleep. I placed my hand on her shoulder and gently guided her away from the kitchen. Thankfully, she didn't resist or anything. She mumbled a couple of incoherent words and allowed me to walk her back to bed. We went back to sleep and that was that. For the first night, anyway. The next day, I told Naomi about her little sleepwalking incident. Instead of laughing like I thought she would, her face tensed and she looked very uncomfortable. It's no big deal, babe. It did scare the shit out of me, though. <laughs> she gave a small smile and nodded. I found it very odd that she seemed bothered by a small sleepwalking incident, but didn't press it any further. Maybe she had an embarrassing memory or something as a result, and she's embarrassed to sleepwalk. Either way, I figured if it happened again, I would just tell her about it. I honestly didn't think it would happen the next night as well. She never sleepwalked in the 16 years I've been with her. I figured the chances of it happening were pretty low, so I went about my day, not giving it another thought. Before I knew it, it was bedtime and Naomi was fast asleep. I fell asleep soon after. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up again. This time, it sounded like a door slammed hard. My heart raced yet again as I rolled over to find Naomi's side of the bed vacant. I rolled back out of bed and prepared to gently walk her back. This time, I kind of knew what to expect, so I wasn't quite as alarmed. As soon as I opened the bedroom door, I saw Naomi. This time, however, she was standing in front of the bathroom door, which is located just five feet from our bedroom right in the hall. Her head was tilted at one side in a very creepy way, and she stared directly at me, her eyes wide open, so it looked like she was on drugs. Uh, Naomi? As soon as I said her name, her lips curled into the biggest, widest grin I have ever seen in my life. Goosebumps immediately covered my whole body as my heart almost bounced out of my chest. That wasn't my wife, Naomi. No way. We sat staring at each other with neither of us moving a muscle. I was too afraid to move in fear that she would start to levitate and chase me or whatever. Finally, after maybe a minute or so, her smile slowly faded and she started blinking rapidly. That's when I almost died. My sixth sense kicked in and I quietly went back into the bedroom and closed the door, not making a single sound. I got back into bed but couldn't fall asleep. I just laid down listening to her open and close that door all damn night. Right before daylight, I heard the door stop moving, followed by footsteps coming down the hall. My heart was beating a thousand beats a minute. She opened the door and walked up to the bed, slowly climbing back in. I remained as still as possible so it seemed like I was asleep. After maybe five minutes, I heard her begin to snore and that's when my heart finally slowed down to a normal pace. The sound of our alarm clock blaring startled me as I must have dozed off for a short while. The night's events were fresh in my mind as I groggily got out of bed and got ready for work. Before I walked out the door, Naomi woke up and kissed me goodbye. I acted as if nothing had happened, not knowing how to approach the subject. I figured I'd maybe talk to her when I got home or something, but for now, I needed to just get out. After a tiring day at work, I just felt like throwing myself into bed when I came home. As I entered the house, chills ran down my spine. 
The entire place was in darkness. The moonlight coming from the windows helped me to see around. Naomi? Why is it so dark? Where are you? <laughs> I turned around, hearing the giggle from behind, and there she was, standing behind me wearing her wedding dress. The white veil dropped down her shoulders, and the sick smile was back on her face. Her eyes were closed. Naomi, you're scaring me now. Suddenly, her eyes opened and she grabbed my hand, bringing her face extremely close to mine. She started whispering like a psycho. No words, no meaningful sentence, just a gibberish whisper making a terrifying sound. Her lips were moving so fast and her eyes started to look up, down, left, and right like she was getting possessed. Naomi, stop! She let go of me and stepped back a few feet. And then, she began to laugh. Her laughter echoed like a nightmare. I can never forget the sound of her horrifying cackle that made my heart stop. And just like all this sudden crazy, she turned back to the wall and started hitting her head on it. Once, twice, thrice, and then her unconscious body collapsed on the floor. I took her to the hospital and also talked to a psychiatrist. She stayed there for two nights, and on the third night, she sleepwalked to the roof and jumped. I will never know what caused Naomi to sleepwalk, behave this way, or take her own life. I don't sleep well anymore. Fear of waking up to my dead wife sleepwalking keeps hammering me whenever I close my eyes. I was 10 years old when this incident took place. We lived in a small town in Nashville. The neighborhood was quiet and people minded their own business. Maybe that's why no one saw this coming. I was living with my parents and my mother was pregnant with my sisters. My father was busy on his farm and my mother was busy preparing the house to welcome the newborn. Feeling a little neglected, I often wandered around the streets riding my tiny bicycle. The neighborhood houses lay on both sides of the streets. Almost everyone was known to us, but there was also this one house that remained abandoned for years. Kids at my school used to address it as Creepy House, and no one ever went there after dark. One Saturday evening, I was riding my bicycle on the empty street when I noticed a black car parked next to the sideway of the Creepy House. To get a closer look, I paddled faster and stopped right in front of the abandoned house. Saplings and weeds were growing all over its roof and walls. Black muddy stains destroyed the paint of the house. I was staring curiously when the front door suddenly opened and a man came out of the house. He was wearing weird looking trousers, the ones that flap at the bottom. His hairstyle was pretty weird too parted on one side, revealing his hairline in the middle. His head reminded me of a mushroom. I was so surprised to see someone move into the creepy house that I didn't notice the way the man was staring at me. His green, wide eyes were scanning me like a vulture. He then smiled eerily and said, Hi there, where do you live? Now, I was aware of the saying stranger danger, so I lied to him. Um, next to the churchyard? and before he could say anything more, I turned out my bicycle and left. The man didn't try to stop me or anything. He just stood there and watched me leave. When I returned home, I didn't tell my parents about him because he didn't do anything suspicious. We sat down for dinner, and that's when my dad made a suggestion. So, I met Pastor Jeff at the church today. He said the Miller boy's fallen sick. Isn't he the paper boy this month? Yeah. So, I told Pastor Jeff Liam will be this month's paper boy. Is it okay, Liam? Do I have to deliver to all the houses? What kind of a stupid question is that? Of course you would have to deliver to the entire neighborhood. Why, is there a problem? So, I have to drop by that creep house too? Oh yes, Susie told me the son of the owner of that house had come back. Really? That's a good thing. Finally, they'll renovate that ugly house. When do I start? Tomorrow, 5 a.m. 5 a.m.? Oh, come on, Dad. There's a reason it's called the morning newspaper, Liam. You'll get paid for this. Think about that. 
you'll be able to buy the new superhero toy you wanted last Christmas. I realized my dad was right. Also, it's only a matter of an hour. I can come back and get some sleep too after delivering the papers. Eventually, I agreed. The next morning, I woke up and geared up to start my day one as the town paperboy. My dad attached a small cart with my bicycle and I piled the paper on it. Though it was 5 a.m., the sunlight didn't pierce yet. It was partly cloudy, so the neighborhood was still in darkness. My dad waved at me and I started to deliver the papers. The lights of the houses were turned off. Everyone was in a deep sleep when I drove through the area. The job was simple. Stop by each house and throw the paper aiming at the porch and move to the next one. That's it. One by one, I finished the houses and finally reached the creep house. I stopped and stared at the house for a second. It was no different either than the other houses at that hour. Lights were off, standing in silence. I picked up the last bundle of newspaper and aimed it to the porch. But right then, huge lightning struck nearby, and out of panic, my hand shook. I missed the aim and the tightly banded newspaper roll hit the porch window. The throw was strong, so the glass shattered immediately after it hit. Damn it! I looked around in panic, not knowing what to do. Should I run away? But they would know it would be me. Everyone knows I'm the paper boy today. If I go home and tell dad, he'll ground me, no doubt. So I decided to walk onto the porch and apologize to the man for damaging his property. Maybe if he lets it go, the matter will be forgotten and I won't be penalized. I did as I felt. Not for a single second did it occur to me that the results could be completely different. I got down from the bicycle, pushed the dusty wooden gate, and entered the creepy house lawn. As I walked, the thick grass munched under my shoes. I stopped outside the door and waited for the man to open it, but even though the sound was pretty loud, I didn't see any sign of the man. I waited for a few more seconds and then thought to ring the doorbell. I knew if I leave now without confronting him, it will eventually come out as I escaped after breaking his window. So, I rang the doorbell. Once, twice, thrice. Within five seconds, I heard heavy footsteps coming down the stairs and stop on the other side of the door. Without opening it, the man said in a raspy, irritated voice, What do you want? Um, I I'm here to apologize for breaking your window. He got quiet and then I heard him walking to the window. Even though the lights were turned off, I saw the man quite clearly when he came to the window. But I guess he didn't realize that. In the small glimpse, I noticed the white vest he was wearing. The vest was covered in blood stains. Even his hands were drenched in blood. The man came back to the door and said, It's fine. Anyway, I have to repair this house. You can leave now. I, on the other side, frozen in fear, lost my voice. Why the hell is he covered in blood? Is that human blood? Oh my god, we have a murderer living in the creep house. Hey, kid! I can still see you standing there! Don't you want to go home or what? Uh, um, no. I, I mean, yes. Sorry. I quickly turned around and walked to my bicycle. I didn't want to run or show any tense movement because I knew he was still watching me. Once I got on the bicycle, I drove it like a fired bullet. Reaching home, I slammed the main door open, which my parents luckily didn't lock after me, and I started to scream for Dad. Dad! Dad! He came rushing, and my mom woke up too. I started hovering for air while crying like hell. My mom sat me down and asked, What happened, Liam? Are you hurt? Come on, it's okay. Did something happen? That man at Creep House, he had blood on him. That man... What? Yes, he didn't me saw him. Please do something, Dad. Thank God my dad believed me that night without question. Otherwise, that man would have gotten away with what he did. Once the cops arrived, they found the man stuffing a dead body inside a sack filled with sand. The corpse belonged to a woman named Melissa Karen, who was murdered on the highway three days back. The CCTV camera captured the woman getting stabbed by a hooded man, but there was no clue who that person was, and also Melissa's body was never found until this night. 
It came out that the man murdered her on the road and realized the CCTV recorded his crime. Not being sure whether the camera could capture his face or not, he decided to take no risk. Even if the cops find him, they would have to find a body to convict him, so he brought her into this creepy house, realizing it's abandoned. He hid her body in the basement and planned to get rid of it, piece by piece, day by day. His name was Kruger Hall, and he was a charged felon in Orange County. Pretending to be the dead owner's son, he planned to acquire the house to avoid the cops or any further attention. Kruger Hall was arrested for first-degree murder and now serving his time on death row. I will be relieved the day he's hanged. My mom says I probably saved the world from a rising serial killer. When I was in my early 20s, I lived in a small farm town where everyone knew everyone's business. I couldn't walk down Main Street without someone waving or wanting to talk about the latest gossip. My neighbor, Pearl, would sit on her porch in the evenings and demand I join her. Did you hear about Tommy? She'd ask in her soft, frail voice as she sipped on her tea. Most of my acquaintances were busybody elderlies who'd lived there ever since they were born. Whispers about Mrs. Larson, the crazy cat lady, or Ronnie, the bartender with wife problems, was enough to keep Pearl and the others buzzing for weeks and they'd pull me aside to ramble, as if I cared. It was overwhelming, though. I felt a sense of relief when Elliot, the paper boy, would stop by each morning to drop off the daily newspaper. I know it sounds silly, but even the smallest of chats with this teenager was enough to stimulate my brain and keep me from going completely insane. Elliot was one of those lanky, tall boys with shaggy hair who always wore alternative band t-shirts. We shared some of the same musical interests, so we'd talk about singers, new albums, and our favorite songs. He'd show up on my porch with bright eyes and fresh topics to discuss. It was great, until it wasn't. I noticed that he started to act a little different with me when he'd show up with the paper. He'd stand a little closer while we talked, look at me with adoration in his eyes and even brought me a mixed CD full of sappy love songs one time. He stood there bashful as he gave it to me. He placed his hand over mine and let it linger for a moment. I hope you like it, he said before walking off. It was a bit too much for my liking, but I brushed it off as a young boy with an innocent crush. I started dating a nice man named Zack, and as our relationship progressed, he'd occasionally sleep over. Elliot didn't seem happy about this at all. Sometimes Zack would go out and grab the paper for me and would come back inside, telling me that the paper boy was extremely rude. He'd make a snide remark about Zack's physical traits or flat out tell him he was no good for me and that I deserved someone better. When I asked Elliot to stop, things got worse. He'd leave cringy love notes inside the paper telling me I was his soulmate. Zack was infuriated and was starting to think I had some sort of inappropriate relationship with this boy. This was definitely not the case, so in an attempt to smooth things over, I waited for Elliot one morning. Zack hadn't stayed over that night, so I figured it'd be a perfect time to talk. I stood on the porch as I watched him ride up on his bike. He hopped off and brought me the paper. Hi, Jenna. His eyes lit up when he noticed Zack's car wasn't in the driveway. It's good to see you. <laughs> no Zack today? No, not today. I folded my arms over my chest and let out a deep sigh. Elliot, we need to talk. About? He moved closer to me and ran a hand through his messy hair. He reached out and grabbed my hand and I quickly pulled it back. He was making my skin crawl with his infatuation. This needs to stop. What you're doing is inappropriate and unprofessional. There's nothing between us, and I think it would be best if I canceled my subscription to the paper. I don't want to get you in trouble with your job, so let's just forget about all this. That's fine, he said with a nod, then stepped back. 
He looked disappointed but didn't say anything else. I was taken back by how okay he was, but I was also relieved. Great, um, you take care, I said, then turned to go inside. Later that night, I was watching TV as I waited for Zack. It was some silly game show, but it kept my attention for the most part. I heard the familiar knock and yelled for him to come in. I heard the door open up and looked up, ready to greet him, but I froze at what I saw. The person standing in my doorway was wearing Zack's black jacket and baseball cap, but it definitely wasn't Zack. What are you doing here? I demanded, jumping up from my seat. Panic washed over me as he stared me down. His eyes were hungry, and he was panting like he'd just ran a mile. Elliot, my voice was calm, even though I was trembling. Where's Zack? The look on his face turned to one of pure hatred. His eyes were much wider than usual. He should be the one to stop coming around, Jenna. Everything was fine before. Make it go back to how it was before, he begged. I shook my head as I tried to make sense of the situation. Where's Zack? I demanded once more. He let out a disturbing laugh. He looked nervous as he shifted one foot from the other in front of me. He turned and hurriedly shut the door behind me, then looked back at me. I didn't mean to hurt him, he said. I just... He trailed off, closing his eyes as he got lost in thought for a moment. Hurt him? What did you do? Tears welled up in my eyes. I didn't want to accept that this was really happening. It had to be some type of horrible dream. <laughs> Don't worry, he said with a chuckle. I didn't kill him. I wish I did, though. Then you wouldn't have to choose. What? You're crazy. I'm not crazy. Shut the f up. He got closer, staring down at me as his eyes burned into mine. You're so beautiful, Jenna. He ran his fingers through my jawline, pushing my hair behind my ear. My chin quivered as I looked up at him. I wanted to run, but I was frozen and with fear. I didn't know what to do. I just kept hoping that I'd wake up from this nightmare soon. It's me, or him, you know. There can't be two of us. But don't worry. I can be just like him. See? He mentioned to the jacket and hat. I could be anything you want. He started humming a melody that seemed familiar. Remember this song? I bet Zack doesn't even know this song. He continued humming, then paused, speaking in a spine-chilling tone. I think about you all the time, Jenna. He doesn't know you like I do. I'm perfect for you. Tears began to stream down his face, but he forced a smile. I could see the pain in his eyes and hear it in his voice. It was sickening. I've invested so much time into you. Why don't you see that? He placed a hand on the back of my neck and leaned down. Just as he was about to kiss me, a pounding at the door made him jump back. Jenna? A familiar frail voice shouted from the porch. There's a man lying in your driveway. Jenna, open up the door. Zack, I muttered, coming back to reality. Jenna, Pearl yelled. I'm calling 911. Elliot panicked. She can't call. I'll get in trouble. I'll be grounded. Tell her to go away. He placed his hands to his ears like a child who didn't want to hear something. He squeezed his eyes shut and sat down, crossed legs on the floor. He began to rock back and forth, tuning the world out as he sat back humming. I opened the door and faced Pearl. She peered past me. Is that the nice young man who delivers papers? I grabbed her arm and we ran across the lawn to her house. We made the call and waited for the ambulance and the police. Elliot was in the same position, 
rocking back and forth when they arrived and took him away. I love you, Jenna. He sobbed as they put him in the back of the police car. He was arrested and eventually admitted into a psychiatric facility. Zach had a pretty bad head injury, but made a full recovery. Apparently, Elliot had hit him with a brick when he arrived at my house and got out of his car. If Pearl hadn't been such a nosy neighbor and shown up when she did, who knows what would have happened. To this day, whenever I hear the song that he was humming, I shudder. Who will always be there in the back of my mind, haunting me. <laughs> 